<clears throat> I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. want to take this time to welcome you back to Live at Five. We were out last week, but we are back. I'm certainly glad to have you here with us. We've got five great questions that have been sent in by you. want to take this time to answer those questions for you today. I'm excited about what the questions are. Again, I try to group them together in certain themes. And so there's a theme here that I see in some of these questions that I want to make sure we get to those. So let's take a look at question number one. How should we be baptized as Christians? Do we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or in Jesus' name, as in Acts 2.38 and Acts 8.16? Do they contradict each other, or is one right or wrong, or are they the same? Well, they are, the, the answer, the, the quick answer is that they're actually the same. You know, there are some scriptures that you use that refer to the baptism in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Others that are baptized in Jesus' name that we see Peter giving uh, as an instruction. And the reality is that um, they really are the same. They, you know, when, you, when there's a baptism in Jesus' name, it's actually an abbreviation or an abbreviated reference to the very same practice that's given to us in the Great Commission to go out and baptize, you know, all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, when Jesus gave this uh, uh, a command, which is what it is, to the world and to his followers to baptize all nations, he was really dealing with a couple things. One of the things that you have to understand is that the first audience that they were going to deal with uh, well, in the world was going to be a polytheistic uh, audience. Uh, pagan worship was everywhere. That was basically the, the worship of the world. So that they were going to deal with people who had no understanding of the one true God. They had no understanding. Uh, and in order to understand who God really is, they had to have an understanding of uh, his triune nature, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the Trinity was a key to part of that teaching. In contrast, when, when Peter is teaching, when he is uh, preaching on the day of Pentecost and in other areas, you find out that pre Peter is actually teaching people who already understood the Father and who already understood the Spirit. God is a spirit. But what they were missing was the one piece, which was the, the understanding concerning the Son, that without the Son, there could be no salvation. And that's what Peter is commanding them now to be baptized in Jesus' name. Now, when he does this baptism, one of the things you find out is that Peter's actually doing a teaching, if you will, again, on the Trinity. He's adding that, that, that missing piece in, which deals with the, um, you know, that deals with the son. And what Peter's also doing, again, is giving us uh, an instruction that baptism is to be done in the singular form, the singular name of the Godhead as opposed to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say they didn't have to. In his teaching, he's simply giving a teaching that Paul will later give, which is that in Jesus Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. In him dwells the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when there is a speaking here of uh, the God, we, we are able to interchangeably use Christ because he is God. So when you look at this, the baptism and what baptism is actually all about is about being baptized into the discipleship and into the fellowship, which is Jesus Christ or the family of God. So which one is right? Well, it's okay to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, able to, it's okay. Baptize in Jesus' name. It's okay to baptize in, you know, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's, it's okay because the reality is, that there is no insistence here that you find in the scripture concerning this precise wording. If we are dealing with precision in the wording, if that's really going to be the issue, then what we've missed is the point that Jesus is making about baptism. He's not about giving us some type of ritualistic formula in terms of how we're to baptize. What he's making sure is that people who are being baptized understand what they're being baptized in and who they're being baptized in. They are being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ as a declaration of their allegiance to him. So can you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. And there is absolutely no contradiction because we come later and find out that in Jesus Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. So if you say can't or if you say cannot, are you contradicting yourself? No, they mean the same thing. One is just an, a contraction or an abbreviation, if you will, of the larger, longer word. That's exactly what it is. Hopefully that helps with that understanding. 
Let's take a look at question number two. How does a non-Christian identify who is a Christian and who is not among all those who self-identify as Christians but claim other groups are not real Christians? Who can say? So how does a non-Christian, an unbeliever, really truly identify who a Christian is and I guess in this world that we live in of uh, people who identify themselves as Christians but also say that other groups who identify themselves as Christians are not actually Christians? Well, who can say is what, how you ended your question. Well, I can tell you, the Bible can say that the Bible is the final authority here. And the idea of self-identifying as a Christian doesn't determine anything. That's actually not the way. Biblical Christianity is not determined by whether a person describes themselves as a Christian. The Bible will describe for you what a Christian is. And a Christian is someone whose behavior and their heart actually reflects Jesus Christ. That's exactly what it is. The, the, the Christian heart is not hidden. It's not something that, well, it's all in the heart. You don't know it. Uh, nobody can know it. You can't judge it. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The, the Christian heart is not one hidden. Here's what Jesus said. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's John 13, 34 through 35. So belief is so important here, not culture. Not, not tradition, but belief. You know, God has revealed to us through his word specific biblical truths. And those truths are not something that are optional. It's not interchangeable. You can't not believe these particular things and call yourself a Christian. So Jesus said this. He says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That has to be believed. He said the work of God is to believe in the father who sent his son into the world. Without that belief, you do not have a Christian. Christians have marks. We are marked like uh, animals are marked in the animal kingdom. And, you know, what a, what a person believes is one of the marks that you will see. That, that's one of the distinguishing marks. You know, when you look at birds, when you look at cats, when you look at dogs or other animals, they all are in the animal kingdom. And within their own species, they may all seem to be alike, but they all have distinguishing marks. A... You know, a sparrow is not a, a an eagle. You know, a hawk is very, very different from a falcon. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, ravens, they're, they're not the same as robins. And, you know, we talk about lions and tigers, but lions and tigers are dramatically different. They have very different ways of operating. You know, one is uh, works in a pride. Another one, like the tiger is a, a uh, you know, a single uh, hunter. And when you look at leopards and look at jaguars, they both have spots, but their their spots are dramatically different. They kill uh, different. You know, one's a ambush predator. Uh, you know, another one, you know, may work, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a group. So when you, one may live in a rainforest, another one may live in Africa. So when you really begin to look at this, there are practices that are distinguishing marks and real Christians have a practice. They have a lifestyle that you're going to see. They have faith in practice. Jesus said this. He says, the one who hears my word and puts it into practice is like a man who builds his house on the rock. By their fruit, you will know them. Listen, the Christian life is going to provide us with distinguishing marks. The gospel is going to provide Christians with a distinguishing mark. So when you want to find out what a, who a Christian is, what a Christian is, look at the Bible. You can't do it based upon what you think. You can't do it based upon cultural traditions. You have to do it based upon what the word of God says. You can mis make, mistake a cheetah for a leopard if you don't really know what a cheetah or a leopard is like. And, you know, the cheetahs and leopards don't weigh the same. They don't look the same. But they have certain similarities that if you don't know it, you can have a person say that's a cheetah when in reality it's a leopard. Now, as far as declaring, um, you know, one group as, as a Christian group and another one and not as a Christian group, listen, we've got to be careful here because th there are identifiers, again, as Christians. And the scripture makes it very clear that there are false churches and false teachers out there. There are churches that claim to be Christian that are not. And that's not going to be based upon culture. That's going to be based upon the word of God. Paul makes it very clear. He says any uh, preacher, any person, any church that teaches or preaches any of the gospel other than the gospel we preach. He says that is another gospel. So that's been declared. But what we've got to be careful is, you know, marking people. For instance, uh, 
uh, and, and, and churches as non-Christian because there is a, you know, a, a we, we may have a misunderstanding concerning scripture, a misinterpretation in, term, in, in terms of scripture. Either way. You know, one person could be right, one person could be wrong. That doesn't mean that they're not Christians. There are specific things that make a Christian. And you know what? One of the things is not sin. Sometimes we'll look at Christian people and say, well, they can't be Christian because they're struggling with sin. Listen, we all are struggling with some things in our lives. And one of the things you've got to understand is that in our judgment, our judgment isn't perfect. Because the Bible says that, you know, we judge after the outward things. But the Bible says God judges the heart. So the easiest and quickest way for you is to really be able to, first of all, you've got to study the Bible yourself where you can misidentify a Christian. But the second thing is that you'll see fruit. It is going to be a lifestyle. It is a life that people are living that will help us to be able to really look uh, at the heart because the heart of the believer is never hidden. The heart of the believer is going to be manifested in their life and in what they believe and what they believe is going to be lived. So, Hopefully that will help you there. Uh, let's look at question number three. <clears throat> Excuse me. Question three says, uh, Jesus says, I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. Why didn't he pray for Judas's faith not to fail? Good question. I like it. Let's, uh, you know, I think the first thing we've got to do is we've really got to set the scene. Uh, you know, and where Peter was at this really, really very vulnerable moment. And Jesus says to Peter, like you said, he says, uh, you know, I, you know, I've desired to have you. Satan desires to have you and sift you as wheat, but I've already prayed that your faith not fail. Now, Jesus knows what Peter's about to come up against, that Peter's going to enter into a trial that is even different from all the other disciples. He's going he's been picked out by Satan to be tested, to be tempted, uh, to be sifted which is what the word says. And so he needs a particular encouragement uh, at this particular moment. And what Jesus is actually praying is that Satan, he says, I'm not going to allow Satan to harm you. Why? Because Peter's a believer. Peter, though he's impulsive, you know, we see Peter with his big mouth. He speaks up when he shouldn't speak. He declares things that he's not going to be able to do. You know, he thinks more highly of himself than he ought to. All these are traits that we may not like, but the truth of the matter is with all those things, with all his impulse, with all his, um, you know, high estimation of himself, Peter really does love Jesus and he is a believer. He believes in him. That, that testimony of who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ the son of the living God, flesh and blood. You know, Jesus says, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. There's, there's been a special revelation that's been given to you by my father, which is in heaven. So when we look at this, we find out that we know that Peter is a believer. Now, on the flip side of this, we've got to look at the betrayal of Judas. How come he doesn't pray for Judas, that Judas's faith not fail? Well, Judas is a whole nother uh, bushel here of apples. This is a very distinct element in the, the, the drama here uh, of Christ. P Peter is a part of that drama. Judas is a part of that drama, but there is no need to pray for Judas because Judas does not believe in Jesus Christ. Judas is doing a great job of pretending, so great that when Jesus Jesus says, uh, listen, one of you guys are going to betray me, all the disciples are looking and saying, is it, is it me? Am I the one? That none of them say, well, it's got to be Judas, you know, because we know he's stealing from the money bag. No, Judas is good at what he's doing. He's, he's a great imitator. He's a great pretender, but he's not a believer. Jesus knew that he is not a believer. It was foreknown uh, before the foundation of the world that that someone was going to betray Christ and that Jesus knew that it's Judas. You know, he says, this is what he says in the scripture. This is Psalm 41, 9. It says, yes, my own familiar friend and whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This fits the description of Judas. Jesus knows this. When Jesus, Jesus uh, is at the table at the Lord's Supper, and Judas has made his final decision that he's going to betray Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, listen, what you're going to do, go, go do it and do it quickly. And, you know, he, it's, it's spoken where he says, listen, the one who's going to betray me, he's going to betray me with a, uh, a kiss. He's going to give me a kiss. And G Jesus, this is exactly what Judas does. He says, listen, the person who's actually going to be the one who's going to betray me is going to put his bread in the, in the sop. He's going to sop his bread. He's going to put his bread in the dipping oil. Uh, at the same time as I do. And exactly when he puts it out, J Judas does exactly what's there. Now, Jesus knows it. 
Satan can actually see it. He knows Old Testament scripture. So as he looks at Psalm 41, 9, he realizes, wow, Judas is that guy. He's ready to do it. And he begins to influence and use Judas for this very same purpose, which Judas is wide open to. So why doesn't Jesus pray for Judas? Well, there's no point. There's no need to because Satan was not after Judas. You know, this protection prayer, you know, I'm, I'm, I prayed for you that, you know, he says Satan desires to have you, Peter. He doesn't desire to have Judas. He doesn't go after Judas for any reason because he's already got Judas. Judas is already in the bag. When Judas, when Judas walks out of the Lord's Supper on that day, the Bible says, and Satan entered into him, possessed him, open invitation. Jesus has given him all kinds of warnings. This would be better if you were, you know, not even born. He said, the person who's going to betray me would be better if they had a millstone and placed it around their neck and threw themselves into the sea. And Judas is like, yeah, whatever. And he says, all right, well, listen, what are you going to do? Go do quickly. Ju Judas gets up and the Bible says and Satan entered into him. He, he Judas is, is, is given over, not given over by God. Judas is given over by his own desire and his own lust. Satan has an open invitation to his life. So Satan is not trying to sift him. He already has him. There's no point. That's the reason why Jesus in his wisdom doesn't pray for Judas. Listen. And there's so many people that look and say, did Jesus know? Could he have been God? And, you know, why did, you know, how could he be bamboozled? Maybe the Lord even blinded his eye. No, he doesn't blind his eye. Look at the prayer. He doesn't pray for one who, who Satan already has. And before Satan entered it to him, it is Jesus' lack of prayer for Judas that indicates his full knowledge of what Judas is doing, what the plan is, and just his judicial love. And making sure that he gives the final instructions for Judas that Judas is going to reject. So hopefully that helps with an understanding of, you know, why Jesus prays for Peter, who believes in him, and not for Judas, who has already forsaken him in his heart a long time ago. Let's take a look at question number four. We're still in the Judas vein. So again, as you see the grouping of these questions, I grouped them together like this because I saw, you know, some of the same similar issues here. Uh, with, you know, Jesus is dealing with Judas. And, and I've got four or five other questions that just came in that were dealing with this idea of the foreknowledge and the betrayal. Let's take a look at this fourth question. Why did Jesus give Judas the power to heal and cast out demons? Um, he was a devil. Shouldn't this be reserved for true Christians? Well, let's take a look at this because, again, that's important for us to really understand and to really grasp because one of the concepts of the last day is that many are going to be fooled by miracle workers. You know, Judas wasn't the only one that was given the this this, this miraculous power, this responsibility, if you will, that would actually at some point forsake Christ. If you look at the scripture, uh, you'll find out in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, uh, there were 70 that were disciples that, that were with the uh, twelve. Right there, eight, Jesus got 82 disciples here that are, you know, going out and proclaiming his name. And, and in Luke 10, 17, it says, then the 70, these are 70 distinct disciples from the 12. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, even the demons are made subject to us by the use of your name. They were casting out demons. They had this gift of healing and they were healing in Jesus' name. And he says, wow, even demons are subject to this. Subject to us. We're all casting out demons. Later on, Jesus will come and say, listen, the person who doesn't uh, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood can't be a part of me. And the Bible says they, all 70 of them, they just walked away sorrowful. You know, wow, we had a good run, but um, we can't do that. They would later forsake, very much like Judas would at some point forsake Christ as well, even though he continued following. Now, what's the point? Well, miracles are not some foolproof um, identifier. You know, if you were doing miracles, you must be a Christian. No, it's not an evidence in any way that a person is uh, from God or of God. You know, we're told clearly in the Bible that false prophets and devils are going to do these very same things. Revelation 16, 14 says this, for they are the spirits of devils working what miracles which go forth unto kings of the earth and of the whole earth to do to gather them to do battle against the great day of God almighty. Listen, gifts, uh, the, these miraculous gifts, they come without repentance. They are not, um, a re repentance is not a requirement. You know, one of the problems that we may have, and 
contrary to the beliefs that we carry around. People who are gifted are not good. The idea that like gifts are given to good people, you know, and uh, you know, you're not going to get a gift if you're a bad person. Well, listen, you may be forgetting the whole theme of the gospel is that there's none righteous, right? The whole theme of the whole Bible is that there's nobody actually good. And Jesus comes and says, why you call me good? There's none good but my father, which is in heaven. Nobody who has flesh is actually good. So gifts are not given by the choice that God looks and says, well, you're good, so you're going to get the gift of healing and you're bad, so you're going to be sick. No, it doesn't work like that. The truth of the matter is healing is by the grace of God. And each of these gifts are given by the decision, discretion, and full power of God and God alone by grace, not by good or bad. Listen, let me just give you some proof here. This has nothing to do with good or bad. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons and perform many miracles in your name? And what does that end with? He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Listen, they were walking down the same vein that your question kind of goes down. If I have these gifts, these miraculous powers, I must be saved. Well, listen, that doesn't make you a Christian. Miracles and those kind of powers don't make you Christian. Listen, there are multiple gifts. And gifts of miracles is a great gift to have. Gifts of healing, they're great gifts to have. But listen, of all the gifts, here's the gift that I want. I want the gift of salvation. Because here's the thing, healing and prophecy go away. All of those things are going to one day pass away. But salvation is permanent and it is eternal. That's the gift that we that, that we really need to have. So let's talk about Judas. Let's talk about these, these gifts that Judas had. Judas, Judas got exactly what he wanted to get. Judas wanted temporary power. Judas, you know, you said he was one of those that received those mir miraculous powers. Isn't that reserved for the righteous? Well, no. Judas wanted miraculous power. That's what he got. But he didn't want the power to believe. There is what distinguishes a believer from just anybody. These gifts that come without repentance, anybody can receive those. And but by God's grace, you know, he gives those out. And there are people who are willing to use them. Didn't we cast out demons? Those demons were actually cast out. They were a blessing to society. They were just temporary. They did. They weren't the gift of salvation. Jesus says, listen, great, you, you, you have it. Uh, didn't we prophesy in your name? Look, you got the gift of prophecy. What you spoke came to pass. It was a blessing to people. You know, no doubt about it. You have those. But you are a worker of iniquity. Why? Because you don't have the power that you actually need to get in here, which is the power to believe. The power of salvation. So that's the dramatic difference. That Judas had temporary power, but he didn't have that which is eternal. That's what you want. That's what I want. That's what I have now. And that's what I'm keeping. All right, let's go on to our final question. This is question number five. Let's take a look at it. It says, if God is eternal and spirit, and humanity was created in his image. Why are humans temporal and earthly in our makeup? All right. We are temporal and earthly in our makeup. That's an interesting view. And it's actually a right view and a incomplete view, if you will. Listen, we are made in the image of God. It is what makes us human. Uh, it's what changes us. It's what makes us, distinguishes us from the ape and from the lion and the tiger, from uh, the slug and the fish, any other animal you can think of. It is the fact that we're made in the image of God that is what makes us human. And the moment we no longer have that image, we are no longer human. We are um, clearly not what we once were in our, in our creation, but we are not what we will finally be. This is not the end of it. Even what you see, this earthly nature, this makeup that you're looking at, this is not the final stage. You know, we the, the image of God has not been somehow broken by the fall of man. The image of God has been marred. The image of God has been scratched, but it has not been removed. We are still in the image of God. And, you know, one of the things about that, that even broken, even in our marred image that we are in now, one of the things you'll find out about man, because we're made in the image of God, we are redeemable. Because we're made in the image of God, uh, God sees us as valuable enough to be redeemed. It's one of the reasons why Jesus came. All of us are marred in some way by sin, by illness, by disease. No, no, no matter what image you see 
us in, no matter the form hands that may come from arthritis. We are made in the image of God, and that arthritis, the, the, the body aches that are there, all the things that you see that are the ravages of sin, uh, years of addiction, all those things, we still are in the image of God. And, but that person can be redeemed. That is not the final image. So you, you said we're temporal. Right. Well, why are we temporal and earthly in our makeup? Well, here is the mystery. Here's the wonder of being made in the image of God. We are actually at this time both. We are both earthly and, and we are both heavenly. We are both temporal and eternal. We're actually both because we are eternal beings as well. Humans are not bodies. No, no. We possess bodies, but we are not bodies. You know, when you look at the scripture, one of the interesting things about it. As in the Gospels, the Bible asks this question, you know, are, is not life more than the body? He said, that's why Jesus comes and says, don't fear a person who can only kill body. He says, but fear him who can kill body and soul. Body, the whole body and the spirit in hell. The, the, in that eternal death place. Eternal damnation. Not temporary, but eternal. That can only happen if we are Eternal. You can't die eternally or live eternally unless there's an eternal nature that we actually have. We possess bodies and our body is really the, it's the current vessel that we're in right now, but it's not the final state. And you know what? The reality is that the real you, who you are, is actually spirit. Your substance, your essence, your thinking, your mindset, uh, you know, what you like, your personality. All of those things are, those are spiritual things. Those are not things that can be touched. They can be altered, but by another spiritual thing. Words can alter thinking. But those are all spiritual. They're not substances that can be touched. Listen, you know what? We, uh, to really understand the humanity and the importance and the power of humanity, you know, the, the power of our eternal nature is like electricity. And our temporal, earthly nature, the, the place that we're living in with these bodies is like a lamp. Now, you know, the electricity is the power of the lamp. The spirit is the power of the body. But if the body should be broken, if, if that body should be destroyed, if that lamp should, should fall and break, if it's no longer operable and uh, the cord is, is, is frayed to such an extent that the, it, nothing can happen with the lamp, the electricity still exists outside of the lamp. Our spirits exist outside of the body. So though the body may perish, our spirits return back into the Lord. Who gave it to us. So understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made to such an extent that we are both temporal and eternal. We are both body and spirit. We are both earthly and heavenly at this stage, all at the same time. Listen, I hope that that's a blessing to you. I hope that helps you. And listen, I'm so glad that you were here. Uh, once again, you, we're back live at 5. We're going to be back here every Wednesday. And we'll be back again at 7 o'clock tonight for um, Past the Noise podcast. We're going to be dealing with monkeypox. We're going to be talking about monkeypox from a variety of perspectives. You know, medical, but also spiritual, natural. You know, how does it impact us? What's really going on? Why are we dealing with so many what looks like uh, pandemic after pandemic after pandemic. Why are we going through this? So let's take a look at this. We want you to tune in as well. So listen, feel free. You know, at uh, 7 o'clock, check out Past the Noise Podcast on YouTube as well as on our Facebook Past the Noise Podcast page. Listen, get on in there. And we'd like to hear from you. want you to be involved in this session because we're here to grow and to learn. So listen, I thank you again. Uh, we'll be back once again, again at seven o'clock tonight. So I'll see you back here. But I thank you for tuning into Live at Five. Keep the questions coming because like I always say, the most impactful believer is an educated believer. God bless you and have an awesome Wednesday.